Welcome to Energy Insights. Today we speak with Sunganda Srivastav about a number of topics related to energy poverty and access, along with developmental and energy economics. Suganda is a British Academy postdoctorate fellow and lecturer in environmental economics at the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment at Oxford University. Throughout her career, she's focused on designing effective climate policy in low and middle income countries, along with exploring incentives for clean energy innovation and finance and the political economy of energy transitions. We talk about energy poverty and access, the developmental implications of energy poverty, the macro and micro costs on countries with populations still reliant on biomass, developmental and energy economics, the gender implications of energy poverty, the just energy transition, the new just energy transition partnership deals, carbon offsets, and the economic diversification of economies and regions still reliant on fossil fuels, along with many other topics. It was great to get Sunganda's voice on the show and hear her thoughts on issues that don't normally get as much airtime as they should. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so we are here with Sunganda Srivastav. Sunganda, thanks for coming on the show. It's great to get you on here. Yeah, thanks for calling me. So before we get started on talking about a really important topic on, on energy poverty and, and energy access, could you give us a quick background um, on who you are and, and what you're currently working on, Sunganda? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm a senior researcher at the Institute for New Economic Thinking at the University of Oxford, and I'm also affiliated with the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment. And a lot of my work focuses on climate policy in low and middle income countries, power sector reform, and also how to uh, incentivize clean innovation. What what brought you to this area? Was this always an interest for you or did this kind of develop over time? I would say that it developed over possibly decades. So I spent my childhood, um, a significant part of my childhood in Fiji. And from a young age, it was very clear to me um, the challenges presented by uh, sea level rise and climate change. But also, if you remember, the hole in the ozone layer, which you did feel quite a bit in that part of the world. So uh, climate issues were really salient. And I think that just sparked a lifelong interest, um, which which has been with me ever since. How long have you been at um, at Oxford for now? So I've been at Oxford since 2018. I finished my PhD here. Um, now I'm part of these institutes as a senior researcher. It's just been an absolutely great place, uh, an intellectual hub to sort of explore these issues. So uh, that's just been fantastic. Cool. So I think it would be useful to just start with some kind of basic terminology here for people who aren't really aware of of the issue of, of say, energy poverty and access. I was just wondering what these terms mean for you. And I ask this because I feel as though they're very important topics, yet they don't really get discussed that often, um, especially in if we're talking about in the mainstream media, for example. And I feel like it's very important because energy is really the the kind of bedrock foundation of improving one's life, right? Uh, yeah. So if you were to give us your own definition of, of what energy poverty and access is, what, what do you think it would be? Yes, absolutely. And I agree with you that energy is the bedrock. So much of human progress is dependent on the type and the form of energy that we're able to harness. And so energy poverty... You know, you can think of it as um, a being able to access um, energy. Uh, you know, do you have access to electricity? Do you have access to grid connection? Um, do you just simply have it at all? Um, and if you don't have access to electricity in the way modern society understands it, then maybe you're just using biomass, which um, is a very old form of sort of energy and one that human civilization depended on for for centuries but we know that that is um not not the best sort you know uh, burning uh biomass has uh, adverse health consequences um and so i would almost think of it as a do you have access at all and b even if you do have access what is the quality of energy that you have what is the type and the quality um 
there's a huge difference in the level of energy uh, that you can have. Um, the best case being what people in OECD economies are used to, right? It's good connection. You can run a TV, your ion, these very energy intensive appliances with um, the lowest being just enough to run a light bulb. Um, so I would look at both access and quality as very important dimensions. Um, and then, of course, you know, is that energy um, reliable and clean? I think that makes a huge difference. And this interacts with poverty quite deeply because a lot of modern society relies on highly energy intensive services. Uh, with climate change, one of those services is cooling in peak temperatures. Um, so I think it really does determine the quality of life um, that you end up living. Now, I know this topic is quite broad and there's, you know, as you've really kind of illustrated just now, there's a lot of interconnected issues. Uh, but if we were to kind of try to boil down to a really minimum level, what would you say would be the main cause of, of energy poverty, for example? Sure. Um, at a minimum level, I would say energy poverty is caused by a lack of infrastructure investment. And I think that that comes from just the development trajectory of, of countries and whether they have the sort of uh, public finances to undertake that infrastructure investment. You can think of it as the same story with roads. You know, we have come a long way in building out uh, transport infrastructure that, that connects uh, different cities and rural areas. It's the same thing with the electricity grid. You do need a lot of public infrastructure investment. Um, in the absence of that, though, you do have other uh, solutions like uh, off-grid, mini-grid that are coming to the forefront now. Um, but if we were to really boil it down, at the end of the day, energy is a capital-intensive sector. It does require investment. And not every country is in a position to undertake that level of investment, nor is it in a position to necessarily attract international investors who have the deep pockets to finance this sort of stuff. Keeping in mind, like just lingering on what you've mentioned about there's differences in, in, in different areas in, in terms of energy poverty, for example, I guess, um, because it is such a blanket term, I'm just wondering if, if you can say anything on the uniqueness of different regions, for example, going through different things, or generally speaking, can we see like a trend over different regions, but are, is there uniqueness in, in levels of energy poverty, for example, in different countries or different regions? Yeah, it's, it's extremely heterogeneous. I mean, so if you look at the energy access question, how many villages in the world have access to a grid connection? You can see that the trend is overwhelmingly positive that, you know, uh, most governments are building out the electricity grid infrastructure. You are having more villages get connected. But I think that that margin is sort of less interesting now. Um, what is really interesting is the quality of that energy access. And there you see a massive heterogeneity, right? So if you just look at the top level statistic of how many villages have access, you'll see this overwhelming positive trend. But if you dig deeper into what that statistic really means or what's beneath it, you'll see this massive heterogeneity where some countries just define it as one household having a connection, and that connection maybe just means two hours of electricity a day, whereas in another economy that could mean your classic 24-7 grid-connected electricity every household in the village. So I think... Going deeper from that top level statistic is what we really need to do. Um, and I think once we do dig deeper, that quality of energy access is a huge question. So at least in a lot of countries in South Asia, you would have heard the term load shedding, which means that every day, several hours of the day, there is a planned, uh, you know, a planned sort of uh, brownout. You don't have access to electricity for those number of hours. Um, and I think really that is pointing towards this um, issue of how the power sector as a whole is managed. Um, in some cases, it might mean that there's a scarcity of supply 
Uh, so the demand for electricity outstrips the supply and therefore you need to have these planned reductions in, in the amount of electricity available. In other cases, it is even more curious because there actually is enough supply, but it's a management problem. It's just that we're not able to trade electricity. So some area might have a surplus of production. Another area has a surplus of demand. Normally what economics would say is, great, just have trade between these areas and you'll balance it out. But actually that sort of trade is not happening um, in many places because it requires two things. It requires grid connection across the areas to facilitate the trade from a physical angle. But even if that exists, the other problem could be the economic. Are those markets integrated? Is the policy environment uh, enabling that sort of trade? And then I think comes the question of, um, you know, what is the institutional structure of the power sector? What are the barriers that are stopping this? Uh, in some cases, it could be institutional rigidities. So if we take the example of India, actually, there are India is a geographically diverse area and it has one grid that physically now connects all of the country. But we aren't seeing so much trade between states because they're sort of political barriers um, and institutional barriers. And, and that, that is something that the country has to work on, because if you do have that trade, you know, take the desert in Rajasthan and, you know, take all of the excess solar production coming out of that and export it to the regions that don't have that surplus, right? And then, then you can have cheaper electricity. So um, really kind of coming back to your question on the heterogeneity, every context is quite unique. You can have other contexts now if you move to sub-Saharan Africa where you might have um, regions where there's kind of dispersed populations and it's not a huge hub. And in that case, the government, government might rightly say, do I need to invest so much money in building out the grid to this region? And it might make more economic sense to have a mini grid that's powered by, uh, you know, distributed renewable energy. That might make more financial sense. Um, but then again, the question becomes for that model, how do you get the investment? Because again, coming back to that basic point, no matter which form of energy you look at, it is an investment-heavy sector. And I think the huge challenge for developing countries is um, they're perceived as riskier. We know that there are financial needs. A lot of developing country governments suffer from indebtedness, so they can't necessarily finance this themselves. How do we get the Global North to finance this? And by Global North, I don't just mean the governments. I'm also talking about the private sector. We, we, need, we need the private sector to get involved at a scale, I would say, is not quite happening. I mean, we need the high street banks, right? The household names to be involved in financing distributed renewable energy in the global south. Um, and I, it, there's a lot of topics we can dig into why that might not be happening or, or what we can do to enable it. Yeah, I, I do want to touch on that a bit later. I think one thing that, uh, that you mentioned on that you touched on um, in, in, in terms of India because I've spent quite a lot of time in India working there and it reminded me of a, a particular area in the Himalayas where I was working and you have this incredible you know infrastructure development of dams you know everywhere right and but then you have these villages that are that are very close by to the dams well maybe not you know, as, as the crow flies, they're pretty close, but, you know, driving, it can take some time to, to get there, but you would have these load shedding environments where you'd have this huge hydropower station, you know, say 20 Ks down the road, but then in the village, there's, you know, there's only light for like an hour and they would really have to rely on the, the small solar panels that, that were on the roof that were donated by a, by an organization. So I feel like there's, there's obviously, there's just this mismatch between, the supply and and where it's needed, for example. I mean, I assume that a lot of that power is going to power cities, right? But it would make, I mean, I feel like it would be make ethical sense to to at least distribute some of that to a localized area as well. You're you're completely right, and I mean, this is the sort of 
This is the really interesting point that I sort of want to make because sometimes if you don't have electricity trading across the geographic length and breadth of India, what you then have to do or what people end up doing is either going off grid and sometimes that means diesel generators, which are extremely polluting and quite expensive to run. Right now you're exposed to the price of diesel and we know that that price can fluctuate quite a lot. It can be extremely high. And that has two adverse consequences. One is not everyone can get diesel. In fact, we know that the diesel generators go to the higher income sort of groups within India. Two, um, it it's harder for the grid to recover its revenues because now you've gone off grid and that's actually cannibalizing the grid's own business model. Um, and third, actually, diesel generators are extremely polluting. And so actually because of this and, 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 and the odd situation that you mentioned happens all the time. I mean, you even have it in the coal areas of Jharkhand where, you know, you're right next to a coal mine. Uh, it's, uh, you know, t- you're taking that coal to a local coal fired power plant and yet the village nearby still has this issue. Um, and this is, you know, what economists would say. It's a classic kind of uh, failure because gains from trade i mean you can really have gains from trade especially in a if you want to take it one level deeper um the fact that india has one grid across a geographically diverse area is a huge strength because it means that we can have a diversity of energy resources ranging from hydro to wind energy in tamil nadu to huge amounts of solar in rajasthan And this sort of geographic diversity can smooth out the intermittency problem. So um, it actually just helps to have a lot of uncorrelated generation on your power grid. But in order to tap into the full potential of that, we need to remove the barriers and enable the smooth flow of electrons between these geographic regions. And so that you don't have this odd situation that you just described um, in, in, in the Himalayas. Yeah, I think a, a, another thing that this kind of also ties into is is you have all this, you know, for example, I mean, I keep coming back to India because it's just such a great example of all this stuff, right? So, um, you know, you have this interconnected grid, right? But then you also have this problem where, again, going back to what you mentioned about the quality of energy. So you have, you know, hundreds of millions of people for example, still using biomass as their main source of energy simply because, one, they can't afford to get connected to the grid and then maybe the grid's not reliable. So then, again, going back to what you mentioned, you know, the next best option is diesel and that's very expensive and, you know, quite challenging to get a hold of. Um, And I think this is, you know, particularly relevant for, for rural areas in a lot of countries as well. So I guess I wanted to just get your reaction on on the current situation like for example th- there's a lot of i guess there's been a lot of developments that should be i guess celebrated but then there's still a lot of challenges that uh that are still there that need to get ironed out i guess what's your what's your take on on how we can kind of move forward in in this area and, and l- giving those people that need the energy the most access to it, for example. Yeah, I think you're very right that multiple realities exist, especially in a large country like India. The National Solar Mission has been hugely successful in increasing our installed capacity of solar, yet at the same time we are seeing biomass dependency. um, And really, I think it's a very heterogeneous picture. Um, And I think, you know, uh, before I move on to kind of some of the, the pathways, I would also just like to bring in the health dimension of that dependency on biomass and wood burning um, and and the sort of cook stoves that are used across India. Because um, I think increasingly when we think of energy, we have to now bring in the health dimension, especially for a country like India, where we have doctors galvanizing around uh, the impact of air pollution on children's lungs or the elderly's life expectancy And uh, we already have very fantastic evidence that shows um, that being close to a coal mine in India increases child mortality by a significant amount. I mean, we already have academic studies that show that very clearly. 
And we have academic studies that also show the impact of wood burning and cook stoves on, on, on women's health. So I think that has to be part of the conversation now. It has to be something that we consider as the costs for the type of energy that we use. And with that, you know, we sort of have to then recognize how much reliability matters. Because if you don't have reliability on your grid, then you will move towards a diesel generator or back to biomass. Um, and that is the, um, you know, or, or you could do rooftop solar if you have, you know, if you're able to get the pay-as-you-go model or the upfront loan, um, which is something that we should actually, you know. So I think there's two solutions here. One is we need to improve reliability as an absolute priority. But number two, in parallel, I think we should be making alterna off-grid alternatives easier to access and particularly by the poor. So I think here is where those innovative financing models for rooftop solar make a lot of sense because India is a price sensitive economy. A lot of our households uh, don't have um, the type of uh, cash in hand or to finance upfront investment in solar panels. So this sort of pay as you go model or soft loans is is a really good enabler to help households, poorer households particularly, get access to it. Um, and especially full solar home systems where the solar panel is combined with some sort of storage is, is what we need to um, go towards since that kind of gives you that nighttime energy as well. Um, so I think those are uh, ways forward. Um, I also think that a deeper issue here is that we need to, on an institutional level, um, think about our strategy for, for coal. And, and I, I really say that because, um, you know, there there's a lot of things that are happening at the margin that could be better, right? So the price of coal is fixed by the government on a quarterly basis. And often because of that price fixing, um, you can't really uh, get the benefits of certain things. So just to give you a very concrete example here, a lot of coal in India is very ash heavy. Okay, so it's dirty coal. It has a lot of ash content in it. And normally what you do with this type of coal is you wash it. Washing is a sort of expensive process. So, you know, if you wash it, then you can uh, ordinarily charge a higher price because now you have a higher quality product. Uh, but you can't charge a higher price. It's simply fixed. So what ends up happening is you don't wash the coal. It has a lot of ash content. That ash content creates more air pollution when the coal is combusted and that causes needless levels of high air pollution. So when I talk about these deep institutional factors that can make either the energy sector more efficient or can reduce the negative health externalities, you know, I'm talking about these some of these deeply rooted institutional rigidities that also need to be re-examined. And I mean, what about the kind of the costs? So if we look at just the the economics of, of what's happening right now. So for example, I mean, you have women who are now wasting a lot of their time still collecting firewood, for example. I mean, that's a that's a classic example of that. You have you have children who don't have access to electricity, so therefore they might not be able to, for example, study. I mean, these are really textbook cases. I mean, how does this how does this notion of energy poverty or en energy access, you know, affect a country both on like a macro scale and also like a micro level? I think the distributional consequences are fascinating. So on the cook stove side, um, women are disproportionately exposed to that pollution because they are the ones who who are cooking and right next to it. Um, on the air pollution side. Um, epidemiologists have um, found evidence that children are more adversely impacted by air pollution because the blood-brain barrier is thinner in children. So that really small particulate matter, it's easier for that to get lodged um, around a, a child's body. And so there's a disproportionate impact on young children um, in fact, there, is, there are doctors in India who are looking at the lungs of 15-year-old girls uh, and saying that this looks as bad as a lifelong smoker. And and in northern India, you know, in I think around November 2018, 
the AQI was so bad that it went to 999 and our devices didn't have four digits to even record what the actual level really was. So on the micro scale, women and children are, you know, women, children and the elderly are disproportionately impacted. Yet at the same time, the interesting thing is that air pollution knows no boundaries. Um, it, it, it is really, uh, you know, our, our atmosphere is a common pool resource. So at some level also, you know, uh, you, you can't escape it. You know, we, we all have to spend time outdoors or indoors. We are all affected to it. Um, but of course, you know, there, there are those uh, distributional impacts and, and inequalities. I think on a macro scale, what we are seeing in terms of those costs and impacts is absolutely staggering. I think um, we have a national health emergency on an unprecedented scale. And I would say that this is one of the greatest injustices that is happening in our country. I mean, if we think of common pooled resources that are necessary for life, I would say it's water and air. Okay. When it comes to water, India already has issues, okay? We have issues with our wastewater treatment, having access to high-quality piped water. But the other thing, which I think we used to have better uh, quality and now it's degraded, is our air. And, and so we look at the basic building blocks of life, water and air, and actually to not price that. You know, now, uh, and, and, and I will say this on the public record, if I see any academic or public policy study coming out of India that does not size the externalities and the costs of the nation's biggest public health emergency and then does energy policy advice, that's like saying, here's a drug with efficacy, but I'm not going to tell you its side effects, nor am I even going to quantify it. And we know that that's not allowed, right? We don't do that for drugs. So why should we do it for energy or for, you know, things that affect our, our, the air we breathe? I, I don't think we're in a position to, to do that. that. That's not an excuse we can make anymore. So I'll go on the record and say for, for any forthcoming or existing work, you absolutely have to size in and price this huge externality. I mean, and it's, it's not just India that that is facing this problem either. It's it's you know multiple countries you know in the global south. I mean, you go to a place like Jakarta, for example, you have a similar issue with air pollution. You go to uh, Lagos in Nigeria, you have a similar situation. I mean, it's it's a ma massive, massive problem. And I mean, the West, you know, is, by by comparative context, we, we've you know we've gone through all of that stage. You know, and it wasn't pretty. You, you, you had some serious issues going on there in terms of health, and and that seriously can affect the the productivity of the economy in general, I guess too. I mean, that the amount of the amount of days that uh, that people miss, you know, working days, for example, if you're to take air pollution costs in in, in that into account, there, it's 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 staggering. I mean, now keeping in mind the the kind of the idea of the costs and the development, I wanted to just get your kind of thoughts on I guess this does relate to I guess what you were just saying about ignoring the externalities of, of say air pollution for example but there is a discussion that that is happening in some circles about you know doing and using whatever energy is available to develop an economy or a country you know for example some countries are proposing you know just can continue continuing to use like unabated coal to develop their economies to to move people out of poverty and, you know, bearing this in mind, like China, for example, is a great example of this kind of policy working and bringing people out of poverty. And of course, the West has done that as well. And there is a certain sense of like moral weight behind this. It's like, oh, if, if you've done it, why, why shouldn't I be able to do it? Right. But then you have to take into the context, of course, the health implications and then of course, climate change as well now. Um, and then, of course, those those impacts kind of exacerbate on on poor and vulnerable people. I mean, do you think that there is any weight to this kind of argument, or do you think that we are now at a stage where the alternatives that are available are at a point where we can kind of just skip over that that nasty part of of energy and development? Sure. Um, so, so really, to um 
answer that question, I mean, firstly, you know, Great Britain started the Industrial Revolution and London was an absolutely filthy, filthy city. I mean, um, the amount of smog and coal, if you look at the historical records, you would see deaths, you you. You would see uh, children dying. You would see people complaining about how, what a terrible place it it was. And um, you know, and and I I actually love going back to that history because to some extent we only hear about the glorified bits. But if you dig deeper into that record, you will certainly see the sort of devastating air pollution impacts and and how there was a huge drive to actually clean up even back then. Um, to just give you a little story here, because I love going into that history. Um, actually, there were dreams of a solar powered world back in 1909, um, even across the states when the fossil fuel infrastructure was being built out. And in fact, technical magazines, uh, there was this chap named George Cove who actually invented and demonstrated a, a solar panel. And the way technical magazines wrote about him was that, wow, this technology can free the masses from energy poverty. It's uh, it's clean. And, um, you know, the, it, it was almost like a beacon of hope. Um, it's a different story that actually George Cove got uh, kidnapped and told to shut down his solar business. Uh, and this is the time Edison Electric and and J.D. Rockefeller were, were growing their oil and coal business. So, you know, we, you know, we, that's a, that's a different story, but, um, just to let you know, this vision, this historical vision of a renewable energy world is not a new thing. And the idea that fossil fuels are dirty and polluting also is not a it's it's not a new concept. This has been known. Um, so now coming back to um, historical responsibility, I mean, without doubt, you know, we know per capita emissions and, you know, there's a huge difference between countries uh, like uh, the the small island nations, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in you know India. Well, India is now close to the European per capita emissions, but but it's still far less than the U.S. I think India I would now rank as sort of somewhere in the middle. Uh, it probably has some responsibility towards the small island nations and poorer economies because it is an emerging market. It's done fairly well, um, and and and. Of course, I mean the the U.S. and Australia are far more. So that that inequality, I it exists, and and I acknowledge it. But what I would do, you know, as an Indian citizen, actually, I would just say, well, what is good for us now? What what is the best technology that we just have available for us? And solar is five x cheaper than coal. I mean, that is just a fact. So I mean why would you not go for something that is 5x cheaper? Um, that just simply makes economic sense, and that is economically rationale. Um, not to be too facetious here, but, you know, I wouldn't propagate the horse-drawn carriage just because that would have been the transportation method that was used to unlock prosperity back in the, the 1700s, right? Uh, I would say, well, actually... Let's just move on to some modern technology that's probably more efficient and more cost effective. And I think it's sort of the same story here. Technology has changed. There's modernization. As you said, the challenges are different. We're in a different factual situation. So while these arguments on historical responsibility and ethics are interesting, I think we need to draw a line um, between what is just in your unilateral interest, given the new technological and cost reality, versus um, this other sort of ethics argument. Um, so I think we need to not confound things either. Yeah, I think this, this in a sense, ties into this whole concept of a, a just transition as well. Um, yeah. Now, for example, I, I, I feel like this again can relate to many different contexts all over the world, but we've had we've got this big energy infrastructure that's been based off, for example, fossil fuels like coal, oil, and gas, and you have a you know a, a, a significant amount of people that rely on, for example, that supply chain for their incomes. Now, this is particularly 
sensitive in countries, for example, like in South Africa or or a place like India, you know, any kind of developing country right now still has a significant portion of their employment and their industry that's, that's kind of connected to this, this supply chain. So I feel like, you know, for example, if the, if the coal industry in India disappeared tomorrow, you would have millions of people out of work. And that's not really what needs to happen, right? I mean, this is that, that, that wouldn't be fair to, to take away that income from people. Um, so taking this into account for you, like how important is this idea of a just transition that, that moves away from dirty to, to cleaner fuels? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. And, um, I think what I find, well, first of all, uh, again, going a little bit back to history, at least in the case of India, the coal sector was in financial distress in the late eighties and it was actually about to fail. What What made it survive was the World Bank gave very low interest loans and injected capital into the coal, Indian coal sector in the early 90s. And that paved the way for open pit mining um, in in India. Now, um, when we talk of the just transition, I think we really need to remember this history because open pit mining across eastern India displaced a lot of people. And a lot of traditional livelihoods, which were based on farming or forest foraging. Jharkhand, which is one of the main coal producing states, the name Jharkhand means the land of forests. It was where a lot of people were engaged in these sort of traditional tribal um, lifestyles. And that was completely obliterated with open pit mining. Now, those people, what they had to do instead was um, either steal from the coal mine, which was actually most of them resorted to that, or for the lucky set, get employed by the sector. And and the way the land acquisition, you know, land acquisition in all countries is a very messy topic, but to elucidate the kind of legal side of it, there is a 1957 act called Coal Bearing Areas Act. And um, you don't actually really need to do too much due diligence to acquire coal in India. Um, it's, a, it's a special act, which is different from the General Land Acquisition Act, LARR. Um, so, you know, the social impact assessment isn't needed. Uh, you don't actually have to do too much of due diligence. You, you actually don't also have to do public hearings with, with people there. So the reason I bring up that history is that Many of those who are directly employed in the coal sector or indirectly, let's say, stealing from the mine or perhaps involved in the transport of coal are um, in some senses actually aggrieved parties. Uh, You know, they had a life prior to this huge industry emerging. But now we're in a situation that coal is there. We can't go open pit mining has such a devastating ecological impact that it's unclear if agriculture will even be possible in those areas. Um, so we're left with this issue of what to do. And I think you're right. It's it's a huge issue. It's one we absolutely must consider. For me, I think what I'm very interested in is a diversification story because um, a lot of countries have had success in labor market transitions, but areas with a healthy labor market are not the areas with natural resources. In fact, where there's natural resources, we see the natural resource curse. You have mafias appearing, you have stealing from coal mines, you have people in these really tough jobs. You know, this is not a glorious job by any standard. It's not the job that helps you escape poverty either. You know, as development economists, We can be very clear about this. No one views a a coal mining job as your ticket out of poverty. It's not. (laughs) So I think that what we need to do from a just transition perspective is go back to good old development economics and say we need economic diversification in those areas. And actually one of the key ways to do that is remove this huge dependency on one natural resource and actually add more industries you know, add more services, add uh, add a diverse diversity is key. You know, we we need that, um, and I think that 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 is what we um, need to do. That that's not so much a climate issue. I would actually frame it as a classic development issue that you want areas to have a broad base of jobs 
rather than just have one sector. So of course, just transition is sort of a new packaging, but it's actually a very old concept. Uh, you know, we I would almost go back to the literature on natural resource curse, diversification, economic diversification, and and job security. It's a very very old literature. What do you make of the 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 new Just Energy Transition Partnership deals that are that are now kind of coming out, um, signed between you know developing developed economies and developing countries. So, for example, like Indonesia is receiving twenty billion dollars in support. You know how, given what you've just talked about in terms of diversification, how important do you think these are, these partnerships are, and and are they the right kind of financing models that we need to help kind of move away from this this uh, this idea of you know having people stuck in in a fossil fuel industry, for example. Indonesia is a really interesting um, example and also a, a country I've lived in. And I think Indonesia, South Africa and India are all connected by the presence of this huge local coal industry. I think the Just Energy Transition Partnership is very helpful from um, an equity perspective because as we know that there is this huge historical discrepancy in responsibility over the problem. Um but also, I think from a financing point of view, it has been challenging for um, developing countries to get the necessary levels of investment, especially at concessional rates. Uh, I think the cost of capital has often been quite high, and it's been tricky to get it at a lower cost of capital. So in some sense, actually, you know, this $20 billion, um, that's getting unlocked for Indonesia, um, obviously, you know, the devil lies in the details, but from a top level perspective, getting concessional funding can also unlock private sector funding. It can sort of uh, le- be used to leverage more private finance. And if it can have that second order impact, that can be very, very powerful because the bulk of financing will ultimately come from the private side, um, but the public has to has to galvanize it. How it is used is absolutely critical. I know that um, there's a lot of emphasis on, um, you know, reskilling coal labor um, and and even closing down um, coal-fired assets. Um, this this is all really important, but I think we need to be quite careful about the details. Um, so if you are refinancing a coal-fired power plant, obviously it has to have additionality. Uh, it shouldn't be the case that it was one that was going to shut down anyway, or it was one that, um, or, or, or at the same time, we're building new coal while you're paying to shut down existing. You know, it has to have additionality. And I think on the labor market side, um, retraining and reskilling programs are obviously there, but, um, you know, we should also. Think of, yeah, I mean, the jet peas, you know, should be also used for that new investment in new modern energy uh, infrastructure. And and I think that that is part of it, that I would say that's almost the one of the most important parts of it, as well as building the institutional capacity for grid operators to manage a renewable energy grid, which is technically different from uh, a thermal based grid, you know, and just the way that that uh, that is managed. Do you see, um, this is kind of not very, it's not related to just energy transition partnerships, but something you said just earlier reminded me of of offsets. Do you see, like, I mean, given all the problems with offsets, I think it was when you mentioned additionalities, uh, which, which reminded me of offsets. And, you know, given all the problems with offsets that have kind of come up, uh, you know, historically and, and of course recently, um, if an offset market was perfect, for example, do you see a role for offsets, you know, in, in this kind of just transition? It's so hard because we're so far away from perfect offset markets. And there's a question of whether we can ever get to a perfect offset market. But, you know, to, to indulge that fantasy for a second, um, if let's say we could show that it, there is real additionality, if we could show that the CO2 reduction um, is 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 meaningful and and will last for 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 a meaningful amount of time. 
then I see no reason to not unlock that channel of financing. Um, it's just a think of it as a market match. There are people who want to pay for CO2 reduction. There are people who can do CO2 reduction. And on the premise that this is all real CO2 reduction, there is no reason to block that trade, you know. But the, the key assumption is that it's real CO2 reduction. And I think that's the kind of hiccup which we've been trying to resolve with these various offset markets where you don't want to give false confidence if it really isn't real CO2 reduction. With that said, though, I do think there is almost an interesting opportunity on the biodiversity and nature management side that it's not all about CO2. Actually, some of it can just be about restoring biodiversity, about creating incentives for protected areas. And actually, if there is financing for that, that can be um, helpful. Um, so so I think that there, there's sort of um, a space for that. I think that it's always something you do in addition to your national plans. It is never a substitute. So you never want to create a moral hazard that now you've offset it and you can lie back and feel good about yourself. I think the world has moved towards a paradigm where it's always a cherry on top. It's a good to have, but it is never sufficient. You always It's only a compliment. It's only an add-on. It's only a plus. It is never a substitute. I think that's a reasonable principle, actually. Do you think um, if we go back to uh, the the health argument here, um, you know, for example, if we were to, if a policy were to be put in place where offsets would be used to to clean up indoor cooking facilities, I think you know, minusing the idea away of of carbon reduction, if we just look at it from a pure developmental perspective, do you think there's also room for that? If 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 it is, uh, you know, put into a correct. Yeah, I mean, I've done some analyses of the returns on these sort of health interventions or even just reducing local air pollution. And it is massive and it pays itself back really quickly because there is evidence where you can show how increases in air pollution or even just indoor air pollution from cooking stoves correlate with hospital visits and reduced life expectancy and child mortality. And these are and and even actually child stunting and poorer performance at work and reduced labor productivity. So this literature, I mean, if you just look at the health impacts of air pollution and the econometric robust evidence, it is such a rich literature. You even have literature that shows how pregnant mothers being exposed to indoor air pollution give birth to babies that are less healthy than those that are not. So I would say that really the returns on this intervention are so high and um, using a kind of transfer or financing mechanism makes a lot of sense from a social return perspective. I, it's, it's actually, I would rank it as one of the very high impact interventions. So for those NGOs or social impact investors who might be listening to this, yes, do it. <laughs> it, it has a fantastic a uh, social rate of return. Ending on that on that good note. Now, if we were to look at all of the economic gains for say, if if everything played out really well, right? We had a just transition. We had we had a a great kind of rollout of energy and energy access for everybody. Um, is there any like good examples that we could follow to get to that path that, that have already you know proven themselves in 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 history, for example? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, going back to the, I think the UK is a poignant example because it was filthy with the Industrial Revolution, but also grew. Um, and now if you look at the UK grid, coal is almost gone. So in the last, so what the UK did was it, it introduced a carbon price floor. It was uh, on top of the carbon price in the EU emissions trading scheme. And it sort of, um, you know, topped that up. And that policy, uh, you know, when uh, there's a good friend of mine called Marianne Le Routier who did a study, she showed in a decade that sort of tax on carbon essentially phased out coal from the UK electricity system over a, over a decade. And, and it's pretty much out. Um, I think that's a poignant example, um, especially because it also cleaned up the, the, the energy emissions. 
Um, and, 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 you know, we don't have electricity shortages. It's actually fine. Um, you know, they've built out offshore wind um, by Scotland and that's providing too much energy that they're actually even, um, you know, they're able to export it. If we look at other countries, you know, there are countries um, with vast amount, actually, you know, Fine, I've talked about the UK, but when we talk about renewable energy potential, the global south is in a fantastic position because it can, you know, it has solar irradiation um, at levels that are far higher than many countries at northern latitudes. And they also have the space to build that out. So what I'm seeing, for example, in India, a very positive story is actually some of the cheapest electricity the world has ever seen in all of history coming from Indian solar farms. And, and that is far cheaper than the solar electricity being produced in the UK, for example. So if I were to kind of paint a vision of the future or, or even draw on examples that I'm seeing now, it would be something that's really optimistic because we know that now we have tapped into the cheapest source of power available um, that can reduce bills for consumers. Energy is the backbone for many other industries, right? So if they can get cheaper energy, their input costs go down and that unlocks productivity and, and um, you know, better functioning of, of industry as well as households. And people might tell you, you know, OK, there's issues with grid scale batteries. You need in intermittency is a problem. But the fantastic thing that we're seeing here is learning by doing and the fact that costs are coming down year on year. Um, actually following a very predictable relationship that was first observed for aeroplanes, that with every doubling of cumulative production, you see a very stable decline in unit costs. That's happening for um, large-scale batteries. It's happening for solar energy. It's happening for wind. So um, really, I think sometimes we have a status quo bias and we think of how hard things are. But actually, the data and what's coming out with the unit costs is a very optimistic story that we are heading towards the cheapest energy future that humanity has ever seen. Um, and so why not jump on the bandwagon and uh, unlock development benefits while, while we're at it? Well, well, thank you so much, Signata. It was, it was wonderful to talk to you about all these really, really you know, fascinating and, 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 and educational and, and, and important topics. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much, Ashley. This was great. If you found this episode valuable, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, share it with your friends or colleagues, and visit our website at energytracker.asia for more. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time on Energy Insights.